How can you tell if there's a pilot in your group? They'll tell you, right? <laughs> so that's a joke. All right. Um, so maybe the, the title got you here, uh, my reputation, I don't know, or you wanted to come here at the afternoon. I got the most challenging class because there's nothing between me and your, your cookie break. So I'm going to try to keep you awake for the next half hour as we go through some ideas. I don't claim to be an expert on Canvas or on e-learning. I'm in the process of doing that. Throughout today, I saw four different presentations, and I learned something from every single one of them. I hope you did, too. And I updated my slides right before here with some of those ideas. But the idea is, you know, becoming an ace. Who knows what it takes to become an ace? That's correct. So that's not the analogy that I'm trying to go for in the class, okay? <laughs> but I... There you go. But, you know... Uh, a kill would be known as an F, right? So we're not going to talk about that. We want to become an ace instructor means that you become the best, right? So when, when you looked at the old French term in World War I, becoming an ace means that you are the best. And so that's where we get the term from. So achieving collegiate engagement, I know they modified the title to make us sound more academic, but I decided to go with this. This was my office right there for many years in the Air Force. Uh, you talk about a beautiful view. Um, I think my view here is pretty good here, the Rocky Mountains of Utah. But let's go over this here. So um, there I was. You know, you, you prepare for your missions. You spend hours and hours studying. You get ready to understand what your goal and objective is going to be. You're studying the threats, and then you look up from your computer, and you see all the students. Um, have you ever felt like that on day one of class? <laughs> have you felt that way? They're already learned, and you're going, what am I going to teach them? How can I make sure they stay engaged? How can I make sure that they get the value for their money? And yet, we still see that. This is the environment that all of us grew up in. Sitting in the classroom with the teacher, maybe going on field trips, experiential learning, you've seen a lot of that. But now I want to talk about online learning. That's a different environment. How many of you currently teach online classes? Okay. How many of you don't but are going to in the future possibly? Excellent. And how many of you have taken an online class? Okay, well then I got some people that have had some great experiences and we're going to have some, a chance to talk about those. So here's the flight plan for today. So military or in aviation, a flight plan is where you're going to go. So we're going to talk about this. Why do students take online courses? Again, this is going to be very, very fast today. This is a fast flight. We're going near the speed of sound. Uh, we'll talk about what it means to be an ace. By creating a flight plan or a plan for your semester, what you do during pre-flight, the takeoff, cruising through the course, your descent and landing, and of course, the debrief. How important is the debrief? Incredibly important. When, you're, when you get done flying a mission, that's where the learning takes place. You learn stuff throughout, but in the debrief, and part of that debrief is for whom? It's for us as the instructors. So let's talk about that. Okay, why do students take online courses? This is the interactive part. Convenience, what else? Fear. Please explain. <laughs> Fear. You can hide behind the computer, right? So, yeah, some of that. What else? Yes, ma'am. It's timing. Our time. Yes. Absolutely. So our aviation program teaches classes through fall and spring. When I got here, they had no summer classes. When there's no air conditioning in our building, which is another story for another day. You know, but they, they're busy. They're doing internships in Hawaii. They're, they're flying. And so I talked to Dr. Bruce Miller, and I said, we could create some online classes in the summer that we currently teach to help those students still progress while they're doing other things. So it gives them flexibility. So these are the reasons the students take the classes, because it's flexible over the summer. They, if they have a full-time job or a new baby or something, they can, they can do their work in the evening. I'm talking asynchronous, not a broadcast, because that is technically could be online, but broadcast means that you're all the same. But what if you've got a student that's overseas on the other time zone around the world? You see how that can be a challenge. Um, convenience, we talk about cost. Often there's a lot less cost because they can do it from home or wherever they are working versus having to pay for dorms and what they do here. Work-life balance, what do I mean by that? Yeah. Do any of our students have jobs? Yeah, most. Yeah? At least one. At least one. And they need to work to be able to go to school. Yeah. And sometimes they're opening up their Canvas page at 1 o'clock in the morning. Oh, yeah. I started with my assignments. 90% are between 1050 and 150. Absolutely. So when you think about online courses, think about your audience. Think about what we're doing. Um, and also summer. Summer is a, a great time because it, they're, they're doing different activities. They want to be on the road. For our students, summer is actually a very good time. All of our online classes this summer have had waiting lists, have been full. It's a, it's a great time. What are some of the threats, though, that, that these students fear about online classes? 
some of the risks they have to take to, to, to use an academic term. Maybe not having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with the yeah. professor. Are there some students that, that fear that they're not going to be able to have a person there? What are some risks or threats that you feel as an instructor? Lack of contact. Lack of contact. That's the whole purpose of today's lesson, is how do we get that contact? I call it engagement. How do you have the contact? Like, I can sit and look at a student, and if I, if I start talking about something and he knows he's missed an assignment, and I just happen to do a scan, all of a sudden he thinks I'm talking to him. Mm -hmm. Okay? You know, or, or I'm going, there, hey, we need to make sure we, we do this properly. And if someone in the classroom has it, they go, wow, he's probably thinking of my paper when he brings that up. So there's a good way to do it. But online, though, you don't have that contact engagement. So these are just some ideas. And I got some sources, and some of it's just mine. So let's talk about this as we go through. So becoming an ace is being able to achieve that level of proficiency and professionalism that we want to have with those students in terms of engagement. Where does engagement occur in the classroom? Or online? Where does it incur? Between which of those elements? Hopefully all of them. Oh, you, once again, there's my A student, right? Everywhere. And so when you're developing an in-class assignment, obviously it's easy to have the instructor-student engagement. You know your material there. But the student-student engagement is what we try to work on a lot. Well, don't leave that out when you're looking at online courses. Look for ways to have student-to-student -student engagement. We're going to cover that. I think that's one of the most in environmentally friendly, fun. I mean, it brings people together, student-to-student -student engagement, because that's what they lack. It's that social element with online courses. So we want to look at how to do that. So let's go over the, the six uh, areas, and there's 12 steps. The first one that I promised you is creating the flight plan. There's several seminars you've seen this week, uh, today, that, that have talked about that. And this is the whole plan that you do from the very beginning. Um, chunk it into to spaces, even though you don't meet perhaps every week or you have milestones, but I always think, Chunk it. City calls it putting it into modules. So have a module with a reading assignment, a reflection, a discussion board, an assessment. If you put it in chunks, it makes it easy for them to grasp. And it makes it much easier to visualize on Canvas. Um, even if those are similar chunks for every module, that works out great. They can have a variety of assessments. You can vary the readings or the videos, whatever you want to do. But if you put it in chunks, and my wife and a, a class that she's developed as a history of aviation online, she has each module be a week. Each module is a week. It's easy for them to see it, to visualize it. For my master's class, I have each module a two-week module. I want to give them more flexibility because there's a lot more reading. And over the two weeks now with work and vacations and kids and everything else, they can do it. So I have five two-week modules where my wife has 14 one-week modules. Um, but try to get, you know, look at some of these things. Prior knowledge. Obviously, you've got to know your students and how to bring that prior knowledge in. They may have taken a course you can link it to. Um, this is one that uh, one of the articles, and I'm sorry my mind just went blank, but a curiosity. Why is curiosity important for a student to have? Yeah. For, for online students, they have to be more self-motivated than in class. I can develop that excitement and that curiosity here, but it's harder to do online. And, and this one article, he had done a study and talked about that element of curiosity. If you can help the students maintain that curiosity where they go and actively seek out information, then, then that can help them out. One way to do that is to have a variety of assignments and where they get to choose. You can choose A, B, or C. Uh, one of the instructors last year here said that they wanted to try to find out the type of learner, whether more visual or kinesthetic or auditory. And so they created three paths through their course. In other words, it was three complete courses in one. Because every person can pick, oh, I want to do this assignment. So she literally had three tracks in her own course. I'm not advocating that everyone needs to do that, but for her it worked. For her, it was able to help tailor the students and pique their curiosity. But this is important, a clear syllabus, more so than in person, because you're not there to explain it. I can come in every day, hey, don't forget, here's the syllabus, this is what we're doing. Yes, you can do weekly announcements, but you've got to be clear at the beginning. Um, we've talked about objectives and, and uh, understanding UBL, UBD, the different acronyms. You heard of this morning from our keynote speaker, fabulous. I don't have time to go over that, but you can use these processes to build a clear plan. Online courses, as a PhD student, I took one from an instructor here. The syllabus wasn't done. It was done a week at a time. And I felt a little bit unknown. Can you imagine taking off, going to go over to Europe, and you don't know what your next waypoint is? He said, okay, just take off and head this way. Okay. He's yeah, well, so <laughs> I knew where we were kind of going, but I felt as, for someone who's a little more hands-on type A personality, I felt a little bit anxious because I didn't have a clear goal everywhere. 
And several of my students said they loved having the whole course available to them at the beginning. They could see it. And two of my students got to work ahead because they were having a, a, some big life events. One was getting married. One was having a, his wife's having a baby. So guess what? He was able to work ahead, and it really helped him to see that from the beginning. So think about why your students are there and what they're doing. Um, here's an example. This is just a short one that we do. And, of course, you've all seen this. You put it in Canvas. Now they can go in there. They can say, here are the date. Here's everything that I have to do. Got it. You've all seen this. You've used it, right? Um, the next one is the get-to-know-you activity. Um, I'm not saying we'll have to go out there and play volleyball. Uh, but uh, what movie is this from? Does anybody know? Isn't it like the 30th anniversary and they're coming out? Um, a with a new Maverick. I'm just, just saying, you know, an aviation movie there. So, but... Uh, how many of you do an introductory activity in your face-to-face -face classes? You do, right? Helps the people get to know each other. Do you do one online as well? Yes. What do you do there, Deb? I have uh, three prompts, and they make a video introduction, and I watch them all and comment on them all. And, um, How big is your class? That one has 35 in it. Okay. That works well. And I, I was talking to someone else. I said, man, that'd be really hard. I go, just like our keynote, how many of them have an, an online recording device in their hand? 99.9% .9 of it. And uh, I tried it out once, and they loved it. There's a great way. So it makes that initial contact with each other. And if you have a bigger class, you maybe put them in groups so they don't have to look at all 50 or 100. You can break it up into groups. But they like this portion of it. They really do. Especially if you have a class across interdisciplinary and other majors, it brings them together. So really look at that. Um, I often like to have one of my prompts, what do you expect to get from this class? I'm sure many of you heard that. And it helps me to see if there's something that's not in my class that should be or to make sure what am I going to emphasize in the different weeks to weeks. You can tailor it. Um, but this connection that we talked about has to start from day one. Has to start from... Do you mind if I ask, do you put an introductory video on as well? Absolutely. Very good. So I, I, uh, I took a class, and the, the instructor was out walking in natural resources. He's doing his video, and he would talk about his dog walking on the trail, and, and that was good. So I did my introductory video when I was sitting at an airport with airplanes in the background saying, here, I'm waiting for an airplane. Yes, sometimes pilots even have to be passengers. And I talked about you know, the different perspective of being up in the front of the airplane versus the back and what I did. So it's kind of a lot of fun. My wife did her introductory video in front of an old historic T-6 airplane, which she uses for the cover of the course, again, to connect it there. Um, but this right here is key. The students need to know what is your connection to that class, that material, and they want to know your passion. It's easy to see I love aviation right now because you hear me, you see me. How could I do that online? A video is one way to show them and connect them to that material. Um, I'm going to skip this here for, for time because we will see it. But this right here was just showing some of those inductory posts. For this class, I said do a PowerPoint. And I told them different prompts. So showed us their family, their pets, their hobbies. And it was just really kind of fun to see all their pictures that they've done. Um, now we get to the pre-flight. Now you've got the overall plan. The pre-flight is what you do right before you launch the airplane. You walk around the airplane, you check everything here. So the big thing I talk about is, is uh, this block is edutainment. What's edutainment? Anybody can tell me? What is that? Education, Education entertainment. Travis Thurston wrote an article on this about gamifying and did a presentation. Um, and the idea is, when you think about students in this age who grew up in the digital world with video games, there's a lot of things you can do to help them see that level of excitement. If you have a PowerPoint up here with 24 rows of words, you're going to lose them on day one. Okay? They need to have pictures. They need to have ideas. I'm not saying that you totally go to entertainment mode. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you need to balance out that ability to educate and entertain. So some of those online games, who's used Kahoot in the classroom? Okay? That has to be done at the same time. So it doesn't work for asynchronous classes. But there's ways you can do surveys with Kahoot. There's ways you can do things. Um, but look at different types of ways to put multimedia in your programs. Look at ways even a simple GIF can help um, the kids feel excited because it moves. You know, if, if you saw them standing in front of the volleyball, that's okay. But to see them high five, you know, you go, okay, I remember that scene in the movie. Yeah, you know, it connects it. So find a way to do that. Um, there's tons of online content out there. You don't have to recreate the wheel. If there's something out there that you can reach and pull in, there's a lot of ways. Um, I know many instructors like to use video clips this morning with Star Wars theme. You, you saw how that kept us entertained, yet it helped him understand us as an audience when we said, oh yeah, I can relate to that. You know, and he kept that theme going throughout his whole presentation. So that's one way to do it as an example. I thought that was pretty good. The next step, and so here, this is one thing I did for edutainment. This looks like an aircraft glass cockpit 
input device. So we have a device in there and we have little buttons that we push. And so when you come up here and you press pre-flight checklist, it goes to the, uh, the events. The remove before flight tag, if you walk around the airplane that hangs on things you have to take off like gear pins, that is the academic integrity module. So before they can do anything, you have to click on here. And every time they complete a module, this horn fills in, the wings fill in, and when they've done all the modules, the wings are all filled in. So every time they come back to this page, this builds. And thanks to, to Ken at City for my idea, to visualize my idea. But uh, so every time you come here, so what would you say the flight plan would be then? What would the flight plan? Syllabus. Syllabus. Perfect. Uh, waypoints. The modules where you're going there. Okay. Check six. Check, and it, remember this watch idea, so 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock is behind you. So if I say check 6, what are you looking at? What you accomplished? That's your grades. Do they ever look at grades? All the time. You grade something, you go, hey, how come I got this on there? So that's check 6 is grades. So you can see how I've kind of, a very simple way to gamify it just a little bit, but being aviation students, they like that. All right, uh, the next one is be accessible. I was looking at every presentation and every research that I've done for e-learning, one of their 5, 10, or 15 items was accessibility. Being accessible to that was one of the keys for online. Now, I'm not saying you have to respond within 12 hours. I saw that on one of the syllabi that I took for an online class. I'll respond within 12 hours. I don't do that on weekends. But uh, you know, whether it's 24, whether it's 48 hours, by email, by text, uh, one individual, she said that she does a Skype at the midterm. At the midpoint of everyone, she says, you will Skype with me or somewhere FaceTime because I want to see you, talk to you for 10 minutes about the course and how you're doing. That's the level of commitment she made because she wants to get to know the students a little bit. She had a small class, about 12, 15 students, not too bad. But if you've got a big class of 50 students, maybe that won't work. So think about how you can do it. Um, chat. Um, but, but tailored to the level of student. You think about an instructor pilot. If I got someone who's struggling, I'm not just going to say, hey, you're a little slow. I'm going to say, you're five not slow, add power. But if you got someone who's doing really well, all I have to do is say airspeed. He'll look at his airspeed, see he's slow, he'll add power all on his own. So tailor your feedback to the student. Some of your students, I'm sure you have, need a little more guidance, a little more feedback. And there's other students that you hear from once all the semester. You know, so when you look at connectivity with that student being engaged, if you tailor it appropriately to that student, then, then you're going to help the student effectively. Any questions about this? Do you see why this is important? Why? Why do you think this is important? Because being accessible allows students to relate to you, to be able to ask questions. If they're falling behind, they, they have this ability to come and talk to you. Because online, you just serve this email address. That's where they get all the crappy feedback, say, things they would never say to your face, but when you're sitting there, you do a meet and greet or you personally give them feedback, they feel like you're invested and they want to invest back. Absolutely. Perfect. They want to know you're invested in them, that you're just not letting them fly on autopilot mm -hmm. and we'll see them at the end of the course. I think there's a misconception with online courses that they're supposed to be distance training, right? Yeah. They're not supposed to need you or ask for your help. And it baffles me every time I get an email that says, should I hire a tutor? Or like, I've never heard from you. You could start by saying a lot of money. You know, yeah. Does anybody have TAs for their online class to help grade? Um, I know that with my wife teaches AC 3050, and she had 50 students in her class. That would be impossible to try to monitor that many students every week. And so she was able to get a, a TA, and then that TA monitors the discussion boards and sees some of that interaction and helps with that connection. So it doesn't have to be used, what I'm saying. If you have a TA or you co-teach a class, you can divide and conquer, but that connection is what makes a successful online course. If I can say anything about engagement, being accessible is key. I had one student who was overseas in Hawaii doing an internship, paid in maintenance, and we took an online class, and he said that every night he would, you know, when it was, you know, a little bit later in the day for me, because he's, you know, gets off work, and by the time he gets to his classwork, I'm asleep, but he, would, he said the next day I'd always get his emails or his questions, because he had a lot of little questions, and I kind of helped him. And after about three weeks, he goes, Barrett, I'm just glad that you're available because I get so distracted at work that I come to class and I'm lost. And uh, it was just really good to be able to have that. This is me on my first solo. And just because you're up there by yourself, there's always someone on a radio to talk to. So that's the visual imagery here. So no matter where you are, 
You always have resources. Be that person on the ground who has the big picture. You see the scope. You see all the threats. You see everything's going on that you don't have up here in this hyperventilating 16-year-old kid. Um, so as I talked about, so here's, here's my link on the bottom. You click on this, email to the professor. And I set this up for all the master's courses. So when you go to any master's course, the instructor's picture is there, and that link goes right to him. Okay? Take off. Now you're ready to take off. This is the launch of the course. This is where you're headed. Um, direction. I said that very beginning. You have to give them direction. This is your objectives. Not today's purpose, but know what those objectives are. Have them clear. Define that they can see it for every module and the course. Um, some people say they do a weekly announcement to define it. Other people have auto announcements. Uh, you want to adapt it. I don't do auto because I'm going to change it every week as we go through courses and adapt it. So I don't have them set up previously. Um, but, but relate it to what you've already established. So say, this week, this is where we're headed. So this is your discussion board post. This is your videos to watch. This is your readings to watch. Go through that information and make sure they know clearly every week what they're going to do. This keeps them engaged with you because now they feel that you're guiding them every step of the way. Question? I do a video announcement every week, but I also set it up ahead of time with direction underneath it. So the video announcement is already there. All I have to do is record it that week and throw it in there because the people just want to know what's up. They don't want to watch Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Well, here's the question. I say mini lectures. Who, okay, who here has take, taken an online course where it was just a video from the back of the room of the instructor standing behind their desk up here going, okay, today we're talking about this. And it was a 45-minute lecture. Has anybody had that? You haven't? Oh, you're fortunate. I, not here. <laughs> In a previous class I took, that was their online course. It was just a recording of the professor teaching from behind the screen, and you couldn't see the slides. Not like today's modern technology multimedia. So many lectures. What do you think the max length of a video should be for those of you who put videos on there? What do you think? Six minutes? Six minutes? <laughs> Five, I've heard no more than 10. Yeah, five, six minutes, keep engaging. They said, if you have a longer than 10, whatever is beyond there, it probably won't get seen. So it's better to have three nine-minute videos than 127, is what I'm telling you, or three six-minute videos. Um, I just, my, I've, I've never taken an online class, but my husband did, tried to last semester, and that is probably the most eye-opening thing that I saw, is that he would open up this one-and-a-half-hour video and go, I just I can't. Yeah. Like it's math already, and I don't want to be here in the first place. I really don't want to be here for an hour and a half, right? <laughs> and so that was eye-opening to me. And I've also heard that in today's world of sitcoms, where we're yeah. very used to being able to have entertainment in these short chunks, and absolutely, check out and then come back and check out, that that's what our brains are controlling. I must confess, because they had a module where they would track your video, so I would turn the video on, and then I would do homework for another class while the video was playing. And I would take notes, because I think I can multitask, right? And then at the end of the video, it would be a couple questions, and I would say, okay, if there was something I missed, I'd go back, but there's just no way. How are you going to watch a 45-minute video all the time? I mean, even me as an adult learner, it's hard to keep me entertained for 45 minutes. There you go. <laughs> if you do have to show them an hour and a half video, tell them they can watch it on double speed. Absolutely. Yeah, even 1.5, you can still understand it. So look here. But here's a couple things that, again, I wish I had more time just to talk about this content here. But there's two things that came up in, in, in two of the researches that I read that was phenomenal. It says, if you give them challenging tasks in classroom, don't shortchange online. So often they think, oh, they're online, it's going to be harder. No. Don't water the content down. If you have a challenging assignment, let them do the same thing. They have to do a presentation in class, let them do a video and upload it. Say, I need you to do a five-minute how-to video. They will surprise you with, with their skills and abilities. So don't try to do that. And make sure it's authentic. So often, you know, one of my feedback, you'll see at the very end, I was so glad there just wasn't busy work because I come to class and face-to-face -face and the teacher presents all the material that I just read. And so I go home and I realize, why do I need to read the book if the teacher is going to teach me everything? You know, so those are some of those risks that you have. But make sure that it's authentic and relevant to what they want to do. If there's important things, give reminders. These kids are busy. They'll miss things. But give reminders of the important upcoming events and deadlines so that they don't miss those things. 
All right, so this is my, my wife's class that she developed for the history of aviation. So she loves to put a quote up on the top, um, relative and objectives for this module, and then the reading assignments, and these are the objectives right here. So those are reading, so these are objectives for each chapter. And so sh she gives them right up front. What does this do for the students to review when you're looking at objectives? It gives them a focus area of what to look for, because that's what the highlights are. Some of these chapters are 20, 30 pages long. But if they know that these are the things that are the highlights of the chapter, they'll emphasize that. And hopefully they do all the readings. Okay, take off. The second part is learner interaction. This is a C-130 crew. How many people are in that cockpit? Quite a few, right? Pilot, co-pilot, you got a radio operator, navigation engineer, load master in the back. But they're all talking to each other. So I like this example because when I'm in a C-130, I sit in the front, and there's a big, what we call a, um, a flight station, because I'm over the flight deck. They're in the back. They're part of the crew. I never see them. The whole time, we only talk through the radio. It's like we're doing distance learning, right? So we have to make sure that we have clear communication. We have to make sure we understand what we're doing the entire flight. That's what you'd have. So how can you do this? And I've talked about it a little bit earlier. We are social beings. Even if it's an online course, look for ways to share information. How many of you do discussion boards? You know, there are wonderful ways to get people to interact with one another. What kind of interaction is that, discussion boards, most of the time? Remember that first slide with all the arrows? Student to student, right? Peer to peer. How many of you also engage in those discussion boards? I hope you do, okay? So it's important to stay there. Um, if it's big class, split them up into groups, give them self-directed activities, and now we're just gonna push the throttle up a little bit. I've been talking too slow. So here's some discussion words my wife and I came up with, and if you notice here, that we give them four different options. This way it keeps it relevant. If you've got 35 people talking on the same topic, it may get boring. Here, look at a way to bring it up with the, the different discussion boards. Now we're on cruise control up there. You're in formation, everybody's flying. See, these are all independent students, but they're all heading in the same direction, right? So monitor their progress. Look at the weekly objectives and see where they are. Give them some feedback, connect individually. We can talk about assessments and the milestones, but the key is don't just put them on autopilot when you're halfway through the course. Um, and so here, you know, little airplanes, this is cool. They can see their project as they go through all the course to get to the end of the course. There's a yellow airplane that you put on the front page. Um, feedback. How important is feedback for the students? Amazing. It's amazing. When you look at online course, I say it's doubly amazing because this is how you get connection with them, engagement. Make sure it's timely and useful. This is one that I added from the last class I was in, talking about self-assessments, making sure students have the ability. As a pilot, and in the, especially in the Air Force, we teach people how to look at themselves. Don't just say, oh, I was a little bit slow. No, I was too not slow. I had to add power. Be very specific with your feedback. Make sure that they know how to analyze themselves. Does anybody ever allow redos? Yes. Why? Because I want them to learn new theory. I want them to yeah. grow as a student. You had a hand here too? Well, uh, I mean, I teach statistics, so yeah. everybody wants three chances. Yeah. No worries. <laughs> no worries. No, but I have no problem with that. You know, I know there's a lot of people when I presented last year on campus, they go, well, online learning, how do I do that? Do I send them to a testing center? How do we do closed book exams? I go, shift your paradigm. We do redos. We allow people to do things. It's open book. You do have more essay questions. That's multiple choice. There's ways to do that, but to stay engaged. A Canvas grading could do it auto for you, so you can balance multiple choice. You know, for some of the short quizzes, this is great. But then I do essays for some of the more uh, big assessments. Uh, Descent. So we're getting ready to descend and we're coming in. What are we talking about now? We want to think about what's memorable. When you go on a cruise or an event, what do you remember? The way in the airport. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but what are the things you remember, though? If it's just a, a normal flight every day, do you remember much about that flight or that trip or that assignment, of course? What do you remember? Outstanding events. Outstanding events. I'm going to call them the weird, unique, unusual, right? The, the stuff that was fun. So think about it. Think about what can I do in the course to make it memorable, relevant to them. And sometimes you need to be a little quirky. Sometimes you've got to think of something out of the ordinary. This is what I love, though. The very two, bottom two, I use those all the time in aviation. How many of you have seen the movie Sully? What was that movie about? About the crash of the Hudson. Miracle on the Hudson. That's right. Sully Sullenberger. You know, but to aviation students, that's a classic movie. And guess what? I can talk. I can relate it in my safety class. I can use it in my crew resource management class. I can re relate it. And so here, you know, I give them examples about what are some things that are unusual. Tailor it to them. Two more steps. Uh, descent review. How important is a review at the end for them? 
This is where you go through there. When you land in a C-130 on dirt, if you go reverse thrust too long, all that smoke comes around you. You definitely get a good review from your load masters in the back. So your review, peer review, self-awareness, um, whether they're final papers, final projects, this is where it all comes together when you're coming into land. And this engagement here could also be peer-to-peer -peer and not just you giving feedback. Have each other grade and have them give themselves a grade. Great presentation by a music professor last hour. And uh, the last one is grading. This is one of the biggest challenges with online courses. It's hard for them to see the transparency. They can't come into class and ask questions why they got this one wrong. Well, try to make sure that they understand exactly what they're being tested on based upon the objectives. And that's key what we're looking at. Um, so the last one is reflection. Anybody guess who he's flying with? It's a media flight. He's in the back seat of a Blue Angel F-18. That's right. So you can see they're all flying formation. This guy's having the time of his life. So this first one I put number one. My favorite thing is a reflection essay. What did you learn from the course? What did you like about the course? What do you think I should have added? What did I not need to put in there? You know, we can do the idea surveys and some of the other things, but this right here I think is a powerful way to get that feedback. And you're engaging with the student once again. As we talked about all these different things, uh, this is one here, you know, um, they love the summer classes, uh, you know, the being able to be honest, it says, yeah, when I go to class, I didn't always read the book, but because you had the workbook questions, it made me read, and I actually had to learn the textbook. So again, finding ways to do that. Um, I just want to say the last word, you know, after you're all done with the class, look in the mirror. Do a reflection on how you did. Taking the student feedback, have another strict look at you, but make sure you're honest with your own feedback of what you did. Um, I always tell them, attitude isn't everything, but attitude affects everything. If your attitude is positive, you will climb. If your attitude is negative, eventually you're going to crash into the ground. Um, let's see if I can get this. Uh, to my students, I'm the instructor, but to myself, I'm always a student. Here's my references if you want some more information on that. We're doing a run the runway on, on Saturday if you want to come out and run the 5K. But again, the big thing is you can become a better instructor every semester. Become an ACE instructor. Any questions before we end? I'm over by 30 seconds. Yep. <laughs> well, let's give him a hand. All right. Thank you very much.